Hello, I'm Eric Ford. This is part two of six for corporate level strategy. How to make diversification work. You know, you're going to invest a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of legal fees at the very least, not to mention accounting and other costs that you incur when you go ahead and purchase companies or launch new businesses. And it's important to make it work. And this is the process firms use in expanding their operations by entering new businesses. And there's two core questions that you have to answer to make diversification work. What businesses should a corporation compete in? In other words, is this something we can be effective as in as a management team? And is it something we can bring other resources that we already possess to bear on a problem? And how should these businesses be managed to jointly create more value than if they were freestanding units? This is the managerial synergy that we're often searching for. And so these are the questions that you have to answer. Diversification is, initiatives must create value for shareholders. This is the classic uh, Milton Friedman way of thinking about diversification. And I would tell you that there's something other than just shareholders. In other words, I'm taking exception to what you see printed on the slide. And we talk about stakeholders. If we create value for our customers, who may or may not technically be shareholders, there may be value to our diversification. Nevertheless, how do we go about it? Through mergers and acquisitions. Oftentimes, if you watch the stock market closely, you'll notice that the stock of the purchasing organization rather than the purchased organization tends to go down in the near term. In other words, people are starting to build in the cost of what it takes to coordinate the new activities into the parent company's stock in the short term and realizing that they may be less effective and efficient in the near term vis-a-vis -vis previous periods. Uh, strategic alliances are one way to avoid this problem of having to actually make the financial investment as well as the managerial investment. And this is where corporations go into partnership to launch new efforts together. Uh, we see a lot of this in the technology industry, even in the public interfaces. Uh, if you play Farmville on Facebook or something along those lines, those are strategic alliances. In other words, Farmville is owned by another company, but they partner with Facebook rather effectively. Uh, joint ventures, this is a higher level of interdependence. In other words, both firms will specifically uh, invest funds in perhaps creating yet a third firm in order to go out and do things. Internal development, sometimes we'll create companies within our company to go ahead and uh, perform businesses. Might be fun to try to think of some businesses you've seen spun off, and you see this quite fre frequently actually, where somebody will start something in-house and then sell it. Nevertheless, diversification should be synergistic. And what does that mean? Uh, you often hear the expression one plus one equals three. That's an example of synergy, where the sum of the parts is greater than their individual constituents. So how do we do this? Well, there's different ways. The most common is something called horizontal relationships, or horizontal investment. And an example of this would be, and we'll talk about this some more, is hospitals. If you have a hospital in your town and it buys a hospital in the next town, that's a form of horizontal investment. What have they done? Well, they're a hospital, we're a hospital, we lie in the same plane of the business world. In other words, we may buy resources from the same place, we may service the same customers, and therefore it's horizontal. This top is most easily juxtaposed against vertical uh, integrations or unrelated businesses, and unrelated is not a good term either, technically, but this is where we uh, engage in buying companies and creating value through our corporate offices.
Related diversification, a firm entering a different business in which it can benefit from leveraging core competencies, sharing, or building market power. So there's some rather innocuous or organizations that you might not think should go together, but somehow the people who manage those businesses have come to the conclusion that they are in some core meaning or core underlying way the same business. An example of this might be the New York Yankees. Uh, the New York Yankees are a very, very valuable organization. However, it's not just the baseball team that makes them wealthy. Uh, there's something called the Yankee Television Network. In other words, they broadcast all of the Yankee games and they own the broadcast rights and they resell those rights to other broadcasters, etc. So even though television and baseball are in many ways two wildly different businesses, the fact of the matter they have in common that they're entertainment. And you'll see that people go into these entertainment industries for good reason. Think about people like Disney. Economies of scope. What does this mean? It means bigger is better. That's generally what we're saying. You can also have what we call diseconomies of scope. And this is where we get cost savings from leveraging core competencies among businesses in an op operation. In other words, the broader our scope of activities, the more we can do. Amazon is a great example of this. They started out just selling books. When Jeff Bezos, who's the leader, uh, the CEO of Amazon, started out, he had criteria for what business he wanted to be in on internet sales. And the product had to be relatively high price, relatively inexpensive to ship, meaning small, and easy to manage and have some overlying system of management already. He considered things like jewelry. Jewelry is relatively small. He could have done those businesses and shipped it. However, he found that books would probably be a larger volume. So he started out with books, but that wasn't big enough. In other words, he started to add other things, board games, magazine sales, etc., to expand the scope. And now Amazon is one of the world's largest retailers. McKesson, and I've actually worked with McKesson on a number of occasions, is a large distribution company that sells many product lines, such as pharmaceuticals and liquor, through its super warehouses. What kind of organization is this? Leveraging core competencies. These are the things that we're good at. Uh, AT&T, for a long time, had a branch within its organization that did nothing but develop new technologies. And that was one of their real core competencies, was designing new technologies, including things like satellites, uh, microwave radio stations, lots of other sorts of communication devices. And they owned a lot of patents. And they also were actively engaged in solid state technologies, things that later would become computer chips and the like. And they had that as a core competency for many, many years, but they thought that the value of that might be increased by spinning it off, and they did so, and it was a company that is today known as Lucent Technologies. How to leverage your core competencies. This is the collective learning in a firm. We often talk about knowledge management systems, and I hope in some of your information systems courses that you'll learn how to use these sorts of IT applications in order to manage these core competencies and knowledge management. And this is where you have to coordinate diverse production skills. We often talk about uh, the matrixed organization where different parts of the firm can draw on expertise from different parts, but you have to know where that expertise resides in order to go find it. We talk about how to integrate multiple streams of technologies. You can imagine a firm that does three or four things well and all of a sudden wants to try to integrate them. Uh, think about Disney, for example. They own 
ESPN, which is a sports network. And what do they do to integrate Disney's core business, which is the theme parks, with ESPN? Well, they have ESPN The Weekend at Disney World, where they bring people there and they try to link the two. If you've been to Disney World, they have golf courses, uh, racetracks, and other sporting events, and they've tried to enter into the sporting world uh, far more aggressively. How to market diverse products and services. Again, this is where you try to piggyback one item on another is a common marketing device where you'll see if you'll buy uh, one item, we'll give you the other one along with it. So they bundle the products together. I'm trying to think what would be a good example of a bundled product. This might be something we can put on the discussion boards. Three criteria of a core competency. And this is something you actually see commercials joking about core competencies. Uh, there's an Avis commercial where the woman is giving a PowerPoint presentation, not unlike the one you're watching right now. And uh, I think uh, Jean-Luc Picard, or whatever that man's name is who played Captain Picard, is the voiceover, and he says, your core competency is core competency. Sort of an amusing thing, but this has been jargoned up pretty heavily. Core competencies must enhance our competitive advantage to create superior customer performance or value. In other words, why do we go to Starbucks rather than the coffee shop around the corner? Well, there's something in the way they brew, deliver, or create an experience that we value over other coffee shops. Different businesses in the firm must be similar in at least one important way related to the core competence. Again, if we go back to Disney, it's essentially an entertainment industry. Moreover, it's a family entertainment industry. So whether it's sports, cartoons on the Disney Network, uh, family films, Pixar, or the theme parks, all of these are typically targeted toward the family experience. Okay. The other thing is they can genu genuinely or generally be remarketed. In other words, you can buy merchandise that says ESPN. You can buy merchandise that says Disney. You can buy the Mickey Mouse t-shirt, etc., etc. So they always try to leverage their marketing core competency to sell you more stuff. Core competencies must be difficult for competitors to imitate or to find substitutes for. And again, these are three criteria. You don't need to meet every one of these for it to be a core competence. Merely meeting one is enough. However, if you have a competence that achieves all three of these, that becomes a real sustainable advantage. Okay, Philip Morris, which was a cigarette manufacturer, still is, brought, bought Miller Brewing and used its marketing expertise to improve Miller's market share. You can see how this goes. Uh, we don't have as much cigarette advertising as we once did. Uh, they've actually banned a great deal of the ads on television for cigarettes, the ads on radio. So most of where you see your advertising related to tobacco products is in magazines. However, Philip Morris had all of this advertising expertise, particularly in the domains of uh, television and radio, and it made buying Miller, as they were seeing that be marginalized by regulation, uh, a natural fit. Thank you. We'll be back in just a moment for part three of six.